so uh, my name is Kelly Parsons. This is the first time and perhaps the last uh, that I've uh, gotten to present at this conference. Uh, and I'm going to say up front that I'm going to take a slightly more skeptical view. Uh, I'm a scientist and therefore I am inherently a skeptic. And along those lines, I just want to very briefly review levels of evidence. How many folks in the room show of hands are familiar with levels of evidence? Pretty much everybody. So it's important to bear in mind that most of what we see in urology is what we would call lower order evidence, levels three, four, and five. Five is a bunch of us sit in a room and say, yeah, this is what we think. Four is our classic single institution, single surgeon case series. And it goes up from there. Three to uh, the epidemiological studies that typically are the ones that the panicked patients come running into our clinic with the stack of internet printouts and they say, doctor, coffee causes prostate cancer. I, I, I heard it on the internet. I read it on the internet. They come in the next week uh, and uh, they say, well, no, 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 coffee doesn't cause prostate cancer. Uh, coffee's protective against prostate cancer. So uh, in that kind of a spirit, as you go up toward those levels, you get to the top, uh, which are randomized controlled trials. And something uh, that I was casting about with uh, as I was looking, trying to decide what I was going to do when I was starting my career, and something that always kind of bothered me, frankly, was that all of the data that we had for diet and prostate cancer was lower order evidence. At the best, it was level three evidence. It was epidemiological, it was observational. We had some scientific data. We had some pre-radical prostatectomy models. Uh, and, and that's about it. Little did I know really what I was getting into at the time. This is a picture of my two children, Leah and Nathaniel, at the time I first started to enter into this venture. This is what they look like now, having completed this study and submitting the paper for peer review. So I, I, I bring this up for two reasons. The first is to give an idea of like really how long, and I know some of the great clinical trialists are, are, are sitting uh, in the room, uh, Lori Klotz among them. Um, how long it really takes uh, for these data to mature. And secondly, to give you an idea, I've been thinking about this stuff for a really, really long time. So what we did was something called the Men's Eating and Living Study. It was funded by a whole bunch of different organizations, National Cancer Institute, Prostate Cancer Foundation. And what we essentially wanted to do was we wanted to take in a very rigorous, randomized control fashion uh, whether or not diet was really going to make a difference. And after trying to decide what was the best patient population to do it in. This was around 2006, 2007, 2008. We decided to move forward with active surveillance. And I want to emphasize here that this was a translational study in the sense that uh, if you can think of phase two, phase three studies that we typically think of with drugs, we essentially did the same thing. We had population studies, we had preclinical laboratory studies, we had these pre-surgical radical prostatectomy studies. Uh, and so we took those and all of these studies suggested that uh, diet, in particular vegetables, uh, were very beneficial and protective against prostate cancer. Uh, so what did we do? We ran a phase two. Uh, we designed a very valid, very robust scientific behavioral science intervention that would get large groups of men uh, to, uh, to change their diets. Uh, and we published on it, and those were the data, that was the intervention that allowed us to move forward with a phase three. The way that our intervention works is this. It's run out of UC San Diego. It's essentially a call center. And these are all diet counselors. They're certified. Uh, they're specially trained. Uh, and they make the phone calls to the patients. The principles are firmly grounded in social psychology. It's, a, it's something called self-efficacy. Uh, which the American Psychological Association defines as the capacity to execute behaviors to produce specific performance attainments. If any of you like to listen to the podcast Freakonomics or are familiar uh, with any of the social sciences or, or read that book, it's along the same kinds of lines. So it's very, very scientific. Our goal was to increase uh, uh, to uh, seven servings a day of uh, vegetables. Uh, we excluded uh, from the study uh, men who were already eating a lot of vegetables. Uh, in Southern California, that was actually an issue. Uh, our second highest accruer, Roswell Park in Buffalo, uh, they didn't exclude a single patient, uh, actually, which I like to point out to Jim Moeller all the time. Uh, the emphasis was on raw carotenoids, tomatoes and carrots. Yes, I know tomatoes are typically a fruit and not a vegetable. We're not going to um, get into the weeds on that one right now. Uh, a, a serving is about half a cup to a cup of vegetables. 
Uh, it's important to note that meal uh, is not complementary medicine. It's not wellness. These are very, very valid pursuits, certainly. Uh, but within this context, uh, meal is a scientifically designed, uh, validated behavior change that increases vegetable intake in men with prostate cancer. Importantly, it's cheap. It's efficient, it's scalable to large populations, and I think this is one of the most important aspects of it. It removes economic and practical burdens from the patients. That is to say, on most of the lifestyle changes, we tend to put the burden on the patient. We tend to say, Mr. Smith, go home and eat more vegetables. Mr. Smith, go home and exercise more. We take that burden off of them. I mean, one of the, one of the biggest complaints I get from my patients is parking. They always want to know, why don't you validate parking? Well, you don't have to worry about that because we set up the calls, or we set up the calls, rather, around the times that were the most convenient for them. And that also promotes the efficacy of the, uh, of the intervention in general. It makes them more likely to adhere. Over the course of the study of enrollment uh, from 2011 to 2015, we screened 602, we randomized 478, and essentially what we did was we flipped a coin. And we flipped a coin and Mr. Smith uh, would get the diet intervention and Mr. Jones uh, would basically get a pamphlet from the Prostate Cancer Foundation. We would hand him a pamphlet and say, Mr. Jones, go home and change your diet. And I can tell you, uh, based on the literature, Mr. Jones will never change his diet. There could be a couple of outliers, but on the whole, most of those men are not going to change their diet. And I was very proud of the fact, because I, I know there's a lot of community uh, urologists in the room, this was by no means an ivory tower academic type institu uh, institution type study. We had 91 sites. And in fact, the majority of them were community-based oncology practices. Uh, all the groups were per, per a, ra a randomized clinical trial. They were comparable at baseline across all the demographics. We were proud of the fact that we had 12% African Americans in the study, which is uh, quite good uh, for the active surveillance space, which is usually closer to 3 to 4%. Um, very small percentage of uh, Gleason 3 4s uh, in our study. The primary endpoint, and I don't have time to get into the weeds about this now. If you want to talk to me afterwards, I'm happy to do so. It was a composite endpoint. If their PSA went up above 10, if their PSA doubling time went below three years, or they had evidence of pathologic progression on repeat biopsy, uh, that was considered to have been a progression event. In terms of the vegetables, did they increase their vegetable intake? On the x-axis uh, is time, on the y-axis uh, is uh, the uh, servings per day of vegetables. Uh, red is the meal intervention, blue uh, is the Prostate Cancer Foundation, the control uh, 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 condition. Uh, and clearly at 12 and 24 months, 24 months there were significant increases uh, in our intervention group. They were eating a lot more vegetables. If you looked at lycopene, which everybody always likes to talk about with uh, prostate cancer, there were significant increases as well. Again, the red group uh, is the intervention. The blue group is the control. If you looked at fat intake, it went exactly uh, the opposite way, which is what you would want. Uh, that is to say, uh, at 12 months, uh, the red being the meal group, uh, fat intake significantly decreased. Uh, baseline, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, control group rather stayed about the same. Uh, and even uh, then, uh, the control group uh, folks were even eating more fat uh, at 24 months. And finally, we did something called blood carotenoids, uh, which are a biomarker for vegetable intake. So this is to counter uh, the argument uh, that would say, well, when you're assessing men on an interview questionnaire, they might be lying to you. They might be saying, uh, telling you what you, you think uh, they think you might want to hear. Uh, carotenoids are a, a very robust uh, blood marker, uh, a biomarker for vegetable intake, and you can't cheat. Uh, you can't eat all Big Macs and then an hour before your blood test um, uh, crank up the celery and the carrots. Uh, uh, it's not going to work that way. It has to be continuous uh, vegetable intake, and that also uh, was significantly increased. And that's a hard, it's hard to move the needle on these biomarkers, I can tell you. Well, and so what did we see at two years? We saw absolutely no difference in clinical progression uh, between the two groups. Uh, this was the primary endpoint, the composite endpoint, but I can tell you we dissected these data every which way with every kind of post hoc analysis that you can possibly imagine because believe me, after 10 years, I really, really wanted to see something and we saw absolutely nothing. Uh, the, the lines were exactly the same. Uh, when we broke it up by pathologic progression in particular, because I know that was an endpoint that a lot of people were going to be interested in, uh, there was no difference between groups. So the upgrading was the same uh, between groups. So really at two years, diet did not make a difference. <clears throat> 
So what are the take-home messages from meal? Well, large-scale behavior change for prostate cancer is feasible. Nobody's ever shown this before. We were able to take a large group of men, 91 sites across the country, and we were able to significantly change their lifestyle for the better in a healthy kind of a way. There was no significant effect on shorter-term clinical progression. Um, the longer-term effects uh, remain unclear. Well, now what are we going to do? Well, we've looked at quality of life, I can tell you, and in fact, we, we, we've had one of um, the most comprehensive uh, quality of life analyses ever in an active surveillance cohort. We put seven different quality of life metrics in there. They're not significant, uh, which, is, which is really surprising. Even anxiety, we, we looked at anxiety levels. They were exactly the same from one group to another. But what was interesting, actually, and I don't have time to show these data today, uh, and perhaps this is a credit to us as our field, um, these guys in general felt pretty good about themselves in this active surveillance cohort, which is a little surprising to me. They felt pretty good. Um, so I think that that's a credit to all of us uh, that we are taking the active surveillance patients and we are making them feel secure that they are pursuing uh, the right course. Um, other populations, you know, we might see different uh, signals um, uh, with metastatic disease, particularly if we look at quality of life rather than things like progression uh, and mortality, we might see some real benefits if we look at folks uh, with metastatic disease. And what about other interventions like exercise? Uh, Fred Saad uh, is uh, running a, a large trial right now in the metastatic uh, population. There are some population data to suggest that uh, intense exercise can potentially decrease prostate cancer specific mortality in patients with metastatic disease. He's doing this with uh, an epidemiologist named June Chan at UCSF. It's funded by PCF. Um, I'll be interested to see how that turns out. Uh, the intensity of the exercise that you need to do in order to see uh, beneficial effects is, is, uh, is pretty remarkable. Uh, so I, I, I'm interested to see if they're able to get their patients uh, to, uh, to do that. So if you look at everything else in the literature. Uh, if you look at all the micronutrients, if you look at selenium, vitamin E, if you look at omega-3 fatty acids, if you look at vitamin D supplements, these have all been randomized clinical trials in tens of thousands of men. None of these supplements uh, in randomized clinical trials decrease the risk of prostate cancer. None of them. There was some great data. There was some great observational data leading into them uh, beginning in the mid-1990s. Uh, selenium and vitamin E cancer prevention trial on top, uh, urologist led, um, Eric Klein and Ian Thompson. Uh, Ian Thompson. Um, almost 35,000 men, nothing. In fact, vitamin E increased the risk of aggressive prostate cancer. And you could give a whole other lecture as to why that was probably going on. So really, every way that we've looked at this, um, we haven't seen anything. We've seen it with, we haven't seen it with whole diet now, with meal, we haven't seen it with the micronutrients. Uh, and this has caused a little bit of hand wringing. This has caused a little bit of self-examination now in our field. Uh, I love this if you get a chance to look this up. I, I can chat with you afterwards if you like. This is a great uh, meta-analysis. Is everything we eat associated with cancer? It turns out it is. <laughs> And, uh, and then uh, uh, Dr. Ioannidis is a, uh, uh, a researcher at Stanford, and he wrote, uh, actually, this one below, The Challenge of Reforming Nutritional Epidemiological Research, this was the most downloaded article on JAMA last year. So there's a lot of, of interest in this field right now as we try to determine what's going wrong and what do we need to do differently. So the take-home message is that I would have for you today are vitamins will not prevent prostate cancer. So I get patients coming in all the time. What about vitamin D? What about fish oil? What about vitamin C? I can't tell them that's going to help. Uh, there's no level one evidence to say so. Uh, there's no evidence that diet will alter prostate cancer. I think it's perfectly fine. I get this question all the time, as I'm sure you do, uh, about healthy diets. I think it's perfectly fine. Absolutely, eat a healthy diet. It's good for you in so many different ways, not the least of which is cardiovascular disease. Uh, but I can't tell them in good faith that there is hard data to show that it's going to make their prostate cancer better. Thank you.